Hello. As part of the San Jordi uh, celebrations this year, uh, we're very, very happy to be able to present um, a translation of Franz Olavilla's Oras Inglesas, English Hours, by um, Alan Yates. And we've got Alan Yates here on the phone right now. Uh, good afternoon, Alan. How are you? Good afternoon. Happy San Jordi. And uh, I'm fine in the circumstances. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. I, I trust you are as well. Well, yes, fine at the moment, thanks. So, Alan, um, when did you first uh, discover uh, Oros Inglesas, uh, English Hours? Um, I first, I knew of it already in the 1960s, can you believe? Because Ferran Sol de Vila uh, was one of the many eminent lecturers that came to uh, talk to an almost still clandestine course, the Catalá para Estrangeiros, which the still only just sort of able to put its head above the parapet um, Institute de Estudios Catalans had for half a dozen um, innocent foreigners studying Catalan in the unbroken philological tradition back in the 60s. And Sol de Vila, uh, uh, Ferran Sol de Vila was uh, one of the many eminent patums, as it were, that came to address we as innocents. Uh, I, so that's when I first knew of him and something of his background. Yeah. I didn't really get into the intimate relationship I've been ever since uh, with the book until I was given it as a present by uh, uh, a guy who is now a, a very dear, close family friend called Joaquim Marti. Kim Marti, who came, again, the lector business is relevant here. He came as lector in Spanish and Catalan to Sheffield in the late 80s, I'd say. Mm. And... Yeah, it was. It was the late 80s, and he very, very kindly gave me a copy of the first edition of Orders and Glazers, wow. which was a, a very touching, even immediately at the time, I saw the relevance and the, um, uh, the appropriateness of the gesture, and I got to um, become very fond of it as a text partly because it contains so many short snippets of um, uh, a Catalan observing English life which lend themselves to translation exercises, to intercultural perspectives, and so many other things. And it's been my sort of adi mecum since then, and the sort of foundation stone of a family relationship that I value very, very highly indeed. I do hope Kim Marti is listening to this broadcast. Yeah, fantastic. You mentioned does that, that answer your question? It does, absolutely. You mentioned that uh, Kim Marti gave you a copy of the first edition. So indeed. When, when was it first published? It was first published right at the end of the Civil War. That's one of the many great poignancies, as I'm sure you're aware, really. Uh, uh, um, you're sending me soft volleys to return to you. Um, uh, at the very end of the Civil War, just as, as the exile into southern France of the last sort of survivors and remnants of the um, opposition were stealing themselves for fleeing. Among one of them was... And it's on austerity paper, as you recall. I'm sure you've handled one. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very poignant sort of physical, tangible physical evidence of the rigours and the hardships and the nobility of what these guys were representing. And I understand um, that... Um... It's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the name of the public. I think it's Instituto de las Letras Catalanas, which mm -hmm. is a sort of 
offshoot of the intellectual establishment, the Institut de Studis Catalans, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the, the, just handling the book itself, which is very sort of noble in its way, uh, but on such um, um, austerity paper, that's all I can call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, so that's the first encounter. Since then, it's, it's lived with me perpetually. Um, so you mentioned the uh, that it was published at the very end of the Spanish Civil War. Um, Francois de Villa uh, went into exile as well, didn't he? That's right, yeah. I'm not sure how long, nor, nor indeed to where he went, but he was back uh, precariously sort of uh, residing when I went to that course in the early 60s, in the pre-post-Franco sort of era. Hmm. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, that that's the um, that's the context of it. So I mean, what brought him to to Liverpool? Um, obviously, he was a historian. To Liverpool? Oh well, that's a long story. Some of which I'm sure you know. You're sending me soft volleys again. It goes back to the days when the one of the early chairs of Hispanic studies in the United Kingdom um, was occupied by a very eminent scholar called Edgar Allison Pierce, hmm. who was a man of letters and a very culture. He was a Bloomsbury sort of um, product. Yeah. Um, a very eminent scholar, uh, a very uh, devout Catholic, um, an awful man to work for by all accounts. Oh, really? But very, very talented. And he had strong connections with the intellect, with the Republican Catalan intellectuals in the 30s, so that when he took up one of the first provincial chairs of Spanish in this country, he saw it already as Hispanic studies. Yeah. Uh, and Catalan was on the syllabus um, uh, back in the 20s, as uh, Son de Biva's book very clearly shows. And the, the, the dynasty of people who've been through that lectorship is a sort of who's who of the Catalan intelligentsia of, of our experience, of our generation. Yeah. Joaqu Joaquin Mollers, I could you know, give you the whole list, except I haven't got it written down in front of me. Um, uh, Joaquin Nadal, uh, Triadu, uh, that if you if you wrote the list down, you've got almost the sort of intellectual history of uh, the post Franco era, right? Going back to Stoldevila in the in the twenties. So I mean, it seems to me that this 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 um, this book kind of represents a very a very strong link between between Catalonia and and well, Great Britain, basically. Um, that started with him and, and has continued up up until well nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and institutionalized um, and and regularized. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, of course, with the um, economic stringency and cutbacks and streamlining of courses. It doesn't have, and Portuguese suffers a little bit in the same way, because Portuguese was almost on an equal footing with, or put it the other way around, Catalan was on a sort of equal footing with the teaching of Portuguese mm. in the mid-20th century sort of evolution of um, Hispanic studies in, in this country. Uh, times are hard now, and options like this are um, uh, sort of withering a little bit. It's mm. rather sad. I mean, the support that used to come from the Generalitat post-war, you know, from post-Franco, um, uh, they're suffering cutbacks, and the lectors that came funded from Barcelona, um, that population is thinner, and and these the the steam seals, they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, what brought you to uh, to translate it, basically? Oh, what brought me to translate it? Mm. Well, I used the book 
I, I thought it was a delightful book to read, and it lends it, it almost invites to be translated, not just because of the subject matter, but mm. because Saul de Vila's prose, I'm sure you know this uh, almost perhaps as well as I do, it lends itself to being Englished because of his sort of um, background in, in his own culture and the nocentista um, uh, high valuation of stylistic rigor and, and neatness, the legacy of Giuseppe Cornet, yeah. let's say. Um, and it just lends itself to um, uh, throwing up conversation pieces or, or exercises in translation at very sort of simple level of beginner's Catalan those little conversations he has with the students, mm -hmm. for example, um, right through to intercultural, um, high-level academic studies. Uh, there's a lovely lady, another great friend through that tradition of the lectors, who did a very good PhD comparing Oras and Glaces, a Catalan in England, with a novel whose name I can't remember, but it's um, a, an Englishman in Spain um, around the Civil War. Right. So you've got the okay. foreign, foreign perspective uh, on both sides, both ways round, uh, that, that lend themselves to comparison. Not yeah. formally, obviously. One is a journal and the other is a, a pretty ambitious realist novel yeah but the perspectives sort of overlap absolutely an outsider um looking at inspecting and immersed in a, 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 a different culture yeah i wish i could remember the name of the novel in question Puri gomez will never forgive me <laughs> um well it, at the very beginning of your um translator's perspective, uh, where well, you open with, the rewards of being enabled to see ourselves as others see us can be subtly enhanced when the tense is adjusted to as others saw us. Um, what, what, I mean, what do you mean by that exactly? Why, why oh, I, that? Thought it was, I thought it was very clear and, um, and concise uh, to see ourselves as others see us as contemporaries see us. Mm -hmm. um, you shift the perspective and it's to see us as we were um, seen by others. It's just the, the, the tense shift that I play with. Well, no, no, I mean, that, I, I recall, is a, a sort of, um, what's it called, uh, um, uh, looking to seek the audience's attention. Um, it's uh, some the benevolentiae is uh, the Latin part of the Latin um, adage that I'm trying to read. Captatio, mm. captatio benevolentiae. Um, that's all that really the function of that utterance of mine was designed for. Well, yes. To see ourselves as overseers, contemporary comparison. To see ourselves as other sources introduces the dimension of historical perspective. Yes, um, that, but I think, what, 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 sorry, what I was referring to is, um, you know, the fact that this book is of interest to to um, English language readers because I think oh, yes. because it gives us, you know, and people who don't necessarily have any kind of connection with with uh, Catalan culture or Catalan. What, what I mean to say is, is that it's of interest to English language readers because yeah, yeah. it's massively, massively. It's, because it's it's not it's not very often that we have the, the opportunity to 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 be to be examined to be analysed from someone who by someone who in somebody else's mirror exactly that yeah 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 it's the, the image is of us but the mirror is supplied by somebody else. I mean, you could do it at every level or, or reflect on that at every level. Hmm. Um, social activities, what people wear, relationships between the sexes, uh, the English Cup final, which Sol de Vila writes about six pages on, 
to explain why he never quite made it to the match because he was put off by ticket touts <laughs> or nervous about buying his ticket from a tout. Yeah. And he makes a big thing, and it's a beautiful conceit to give you a description of cup final day from outside the ground, mm -hmm. um, as witnessed by, in inverted commas, an, an innocent abroad. Yeah. And that runs through the whole thing, that just some of the more customista aspects of the book uh, that you, I'm sure, recall, um, like his travels, um, travels, did he go to Wales? I can't remember. Yeah, he passed yes, through he Wales. Did, yes, yeah. he went to Wales, Scotland, the Lake District. Um, so there's a, 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 a serious component of contemporary, that is, you know, to the, of those times, mm. the life and the history and the landscape, modes of transport, uh, but seen always through foreign eyes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, he even went, he went to Oxford as well, quite memorably, where he came across... Oh, yes. um... Yeah, yeah. Oxford, his choice of places to go was very proper, very tasteful, though places you'd like him to have gone to be able to um, uh, read his version of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's pretty thorough. Uh, London, Oxford, Cambridge, of course, <laughs> keeping the balance. Um, uh, the North East, North West. Uh, the Highlands, which is about the lumpiest and, you know, the more conventional bit of his travel writing, but um, it's all done in, with the same elegance and stylistic neatness and the twinkle in the eye, which I can still recall he had uh, when I had the good fortune to encounter him that once. Right. Um, well, I mean... It, it... One of the things that I particularly like about the book is the way uh, you know he doesn't necessarily only touch on on the big things, but rather the smaller things as well. Um, oh, yes. You know, yeah. the, the weather, for example. Yeah, well, I use the word customismo, uh, which runs through the whole thing, and the sort of the innocent, not really innocent, because he was a very civilized and cosmopolitan man, but rather sort of shy and, and discreet. Uh, but just observing things like meal times and how people sit on the tram and yeah. how nice there's one memorable bit on it. I think it's a tram. It might have been a bus where he sits squashed up against a young lady um, in a busy uh, stretch of the journey. And then neither of them move, even though there are empty spaces on either <laughs> side and, and spare seats all over the place in the vehicle. Yeah. And he speculates with that twinkle in his eye that, you know, there were two unknown people unknown to each other sharing a bit of company and human contact with a little bit of an erotic free song uh, that we needn't go into. Yeah. Well, it's just, um, you know, that obviously, there are lots of stereotypes about the British and, and things like this. And it's funny that he does bring them up. And it's, uh, you know, he talks about the weather, he talks about social um, social etiquette, he talks about the food. There's one uh, there's one particular entry, particular entry that I'm looking at now uh, from West Kirby, the 6th of October, 1926. And he says, we are now installed, uh, the weather very overcast, the journey between Liverpool and West Kirby, which I should have to make reg uh, regularly, seemed rather desolate. Despite the drizzle and the cold wind, one could s occasionally see figures walking about in the green spaces which were not built up. At first, looking afar, I could not understand what they were doing. Then I realised they were playing golf. <laughs> um, and for me, it's just fantastic, you know, because for, for, for a, a Catalan man, and uh, as both you and I know, you know, when it rains in Catalonia, uh, things get cancelled, put it that way. <laughs> um, to well, arrive here, in... it needs must, as you know. It's well, exactly. even better, probably, than I do. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's all sorts of charming little things like that. Every time I go back to it, I find something else, which is one of the signs of, of a, a, a true classic, I think. I know I've, I've got a very uh, particular and intense subjective um, involvement with the book, but the, 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 
the fact that it withstands so many re-readings, and every time you open it, you come on something that you haven't quite got in the, um, the perspective it now presents for you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, there are also a number of uh, short and slightly longer poems in the book. Um, what was he a poet? Yeah, and or... let me interject there that the prose at times is deliberately poetic because he was, you know, he was very sensitive to the the sharp end vanguard artistic currents of his time, and some of the simple, the shorter prose pieces are, you know, poetic in the same sense. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, I cut across you, and he did publish poems as well. Yeah. Well, if I may, I might, I might just read one now um, from the 30th of Please October. Please do. It will give us great joy to, um, to be read to. <laughs> well, it's from the 30th of October, um, Northern Sun. Uh, sun glow coming into my room, sun glow. Amber your morning splendour, red now in the enchanted setting of an iridescent evening, sun glow. May your light which laughs and cries, your light... Brightness, sound and warmth together, perfume and blessed sweetness. Uh, may it give fragrance to my life, your light. In the eyes of my beloved, the eyes where my peace has found refreshment, eyes full of such reticent tenderness, may there be a gleam of your eye, lovely eyes. In my lines inspired by time, my poem on delights or irritations, varied like a life in time elapsing. May your shimmer be reflected, my poem. In the moment of my life's end, instant of the coffin and of the shroud, gliding beneath my eyelids when they're closed, please enlighten the darkness for me, just then. So it's, for, for me, it's remarkable. It's a book, you know, a, a sort it's a, it's a, oh, and thank you for that recitation. Let me say that first. It, 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 it sounds like a poem, and it's a very well wrought um poetic exposition of, um, you know, of a person's feelings. Yeah, I mean, it, it brings me back to what you mentioned in your, um, in your translator's uh, perspective, where it's, it's this in your answer um, yeah. of, of certain things. Um, yeah, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a problem to start with, isn't there, for the translator? Hmm. And your answer, but it's more than homesickness, but it's not just homesickness. It's a sense of the past, of identification with and through the past. And it's very, very Catalan, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which which brings us very nicely on to, uh, to the next thing that I wanted to talk about. The um, So your translation, uh, you say that it, it, it was... Englished, it was sort of, you know, it sort of inc invited itself to be Englished by you. Um, yeah. Did it did it happen quickly? I mean, or, or was it over a period of many no, years? No, well, over the years, and I tinkered with it. And of course, King Marti, who who was so um, generously and and appropriately gifted me with it is himself a translator. I don't think he got that anywhere in his mind. It was just the Anglo-Catalan connection that he was uh, marking or celebrating. Um, but, um, sorry, go on. No, 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 please. You were going to say something. No, 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 it's okay. I deal with the translation, yeah, and it just, um, it just sort of kept, calling me and every time it called me I found something else and how would you put that in English and could you English this and that and then there was a period in, in the time when we were preparing the edition that Jordi Raventos, bless him, um, hope he's listening to this, give him my best wishes if he's not, um, came up with the proposal to make a contribution to a uh, an edition that uh, Desiara, his uh, brainchild, uh, they put out. God, I think it's about 10 years ago now. It's a while, yeah. But there were long periods between sending him stuff and looking at proofs and then receiving. That was in the days when proofs came on lovely paper. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I 
I started tinkering with it and translating it in my own mind and and marking time, really, I set about it without any great sort of impetus or commitment or even, you know, intending to do anything else with it. And then I thought, well, it's worth, worth you know, thinking about getting it published. And I, I was convinced in my own mind that Liverpool University Press really couldn't say no. Yeah. Well, they did three or four times. <laughs> Um, because they're an academic publisher and this is literature pure, despite the you know the local interest as it or institutional interest as well. Um, and um, then more recently, four or five years ago, I can't remember now. After I'd sort of gone back to it and worked on it a bit more systematically for that edition of. Um, Adesiara, which is about 10 years old now, I think, um, I thought, bugger, it would be a shame if I go to the um, to the grave with this um, just inside the computer and in pencil notes in the margins, etc. I'm going to put it in, into print at a time when self-publication was um, getting easier and easier because of the... Um, the technological advances, and I think this is uh, the point of the story where you come in. Mm. I'd already commissioned with a local um, guy, a very good typesetter, very artistically, very sensitive, and he got hooked on the project as well, fell in love with the book. Um, and we were at proof stage, as you know, mm. uh, and then because of family reasons, he had to step back. And um, uh, that's where the stage I was at when I uh, had the good fortune to meet up with you on the highway there. Yeah. Um, end of story. But it, again, it was done initially just for the satisfaction of, of getting close enough to the, even closer to the text that normal reading supplies. Yeah. As Giuseppe Carnes put it very neatly, Trudui uh, is quite, how does it go? Trudui is in a million manera de yeji, in a million manera de pendra scrura. Yeah. That's uh, very Carnarian and uh, very true, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, look, Alan, uh, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, um, if it's been a pleasure for you, Doug, that gives me even more pleasure than I've had from this conversation. I'm sure we'll have other ones. Exactly, exactly. Um, fantastic. So, look, um, what I'll do is um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, if anyone is listening, thanks very much for listening. Um, and, of course, if you uh, go into the website, the Fumba Stamper website, you can buy it there. Um, and it would be uh, lovely to hear your thoughts on anything. So, uh, Alan, thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, and I look forward to future communication on other topics, but related ones. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay.